Hello, good afternoon or good evening from UK and good morning to those from very west and uh, good afternoon to Dr. Smith and Dr. Jallo. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Smith give us this lecture on corpus callosotomy, uh, uh, open and lit techniques and outcomes. Um, epilepsy surgery uh, uh, is a multidisciplinary um, uh, uh, process and uh, and it's a fast uh, advancing field uh, and uh, certainly the lit technique is um, being adapted in many centers um, including efforts in UK. Uh, Dr. Smith um, is the professor uh, and uh, chairman of uh, pediatric neurosurgery at uh, uh, All Children's uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Florida. He had uh, um, been uh, a professor uh, of neurosurgery and pediatric neurosurgery at, um, uh, at um, Washington University in Missouri before he moved to Florida and he had done his fellowship in uh, Alabama. He's the uh, chair elect of the uh, joint WANS CNS uh, Committee of Pediatric Neurosurgery. So it's a real honor and privilege to have him. We have also with us um, uh, two eminent uh, panelists, uh, Professor Machado uh, from Sao Paulo. Uh, he's a doyen of pediatric neurosurgery and uh, one of the leaders of pediatric uh, epilepsy surgery. Uh, he's at the Center of Epilepsy, epilepsy Surgery at the University of Sao Paulo uh, in Ribeiro. And uh, uh, we also have Dr. Uh, John Ellenbogen. He's a, a pediatric neurosurgeon uh, and adult neurosurgeon, but main focus is pediatrics at uh, the Older Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool and Manchester Children's Hospital in Manchester. And uh, he also does the adult work where I am at Salford Royal Hospital. Uh, so thank you very much to this uh, to Dr. Smith and to Dr. Professor Machado and uh, Dr. Elambogen for taking the time to um, uh, elucidate this important area. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Smith, can I please uh, invite you to give your lecture? Thank you, sir. Thanks, Naren. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody. Um, so uh, you see the slide there and the title that Dr. Uh, that Naren already read for us. Um, I do have a couple of disclosures um, of devices discussed during this talk. So I am a consultant for Monteris Medical, which is one of the systems to deliver laser ablation, and for the surgical Rosa robot, which is made by Biomet Zimmer. Um, another another disclosure I should say too is that the majority of this data was developed during my time at Washington University and preceded my arrival here in Florida about a year ago. Um, so I've structured the talk um, with this following uh, overview. So we'll talk a little bit about a brief history of callosotomy, some historical um, uh, vignettes of interest. I'll then spend about half the time talking about traditional open surgery, the technique that I like to use and some outcomes, and then the minimally invasive alternatives, um, primarily laser ablation. And I, I'm going to try and set aside, um, I was asked to spend maybe 10, 10 minutes or so on Q&A with our panelists. Um, so as we all know, the callosum is the largest commissural pathway, has about a quarter billion axons in it. And when we cut or section the callosum, we, we get bisynchrony. And this has been known for a long time to provide relief from drop attacks. Um, typically, it's performed um, classically with an anterior one-half to two-thirds cutting of the corpus callosum, and it's effective at reducing uh, drop seizures or atonic seizures by, by preventing the rapid spread of epileptiform activity between the hemispheres, but it's also effective for other generalized seizure types. Um, 
This little video here is showing uh, in an EG video unit, a little child who's demonstrating a drop seizure. So he's doing his own thing and then all of a sudden just loses tone. You'll see here that the mother blows in his face as a stimulus and boom, he just drops. So these, these uh, seizure types are the ones that, that result in patients getting facial trauma, head trauma, dental injuries, lacerations and the like. Um, these are the patients that wear helmets and are on a lot of anticonvulsants typically. So callosotomy is classically the um, most effective treatment for this seizure type, although there are some medical therapies, including more recently Fintepla coming out that may have some additional effectiveness on atonic seizures, more so than the more traditional anticonvulsants. Um, when I looked through the literature, the first report of a callosotomy I could find was from uh, Dr. Walter Dandy almost 100 years ago when he was in Baltimore. And in this case, he was performing a surgery for uh, a cavum septum pellucidum that he approached via an interhemispheric transcolosal approach depicted here in a lateral position. So the pneumoencephalogram is showing this displacement of a structure in the, in the septum pellucidum. I, I'm not sure that he knew whether this was a cyst or a, a tumor, but he explored it, fenestrated it, and you can see his craniotomy there. But what he noted was that the patient who incidentally had spells or seizures, the seizures were relieved by the operation. And so um, then Van Wagenen over the subsequent decade and uh, Heron provide, uh, performed a series of callosotomies directed for epilepsy. And the uh, operation that they performed via an interhemispheric approach with a, a frontal craniotomy is not too dissimilar to what uh, most centers are still performing. So multiple centers over the decades have continued to perform open callosotomy and publish their results. Um, the commonalities in this table are that the majority of patients have a significant reduction in their drop seizures, but there is an associated complication rate ranging between 5 and 15%. Um, it, depending on what you define as a complication, but surgical complication requiring a separate op separate operation might be in that range of, of 5 to 15 percent. Um, this is just a short video depicting the approach that I typically use for a callostotomy. I, I like a supine approach. Um, I go between a bicoronal incision and a trapdoor incision. They're both effective. A craniotomy is half in front and half behind the coronal suture crossing the midline, so the sagittal sinus is underneath the gel foam here. I reflect the dura medially, and I do incorporate a single frontal lobe brain retractor, and I, I try to minimize retraction with um, gently aspirating the CSF. I give mannitol, I gently hyperventilate, and I keep the head of the bed elevated. So you can typically do this for about a one centimeter, maybe 15 millimeter window to minimize frontal lobe retraction. Uh, as for bridging veins, um, I typically will sacrifice any bridging veins that are at or in front of the coronal suture. And if there's bridging veins behind the coronal suture, I do my best to preserve them, even though that might mean a, a fairly short truncated window to do your exposure. Um, often the cinguli are, are um, stu stuck together and you need to dissect them apart. Um, in this particular case, you can see there's a little uh, contusion of the cingulum that we're trying to work around and not, not uh, extend. And here you can see the glistening white structure, the corpus callosum, the pericolosal arteries, and the colossal marginals. We're teasing them apart. Um, this particular patient had a, a unique uh, variation of anatomy where there was an accessory anterior communicating artery between the two uh, colossal marginals, which you can start to see right here. So in this case, we had to work kind of in front of and behind that uh, communicating artery to preserve it. Um, for cutting the callosum, I, I've sampled a few different things. I've used the, the Cavitron ultrasonic aspirator. I've used the flexible CO2 uh, Omni laser, but I think just bipolar cautery to sort of uh, uh, free up the tissue to coagulate the um, fibers. And then suction is really the most effective thing to use. And you can have a pretty low profile with the sucker and the bipolar to minimize retraction. So here, my target is always, I try to stay directly, perfectly in the midline so that when we do enter that uh, septum pellucidum, we're not entering either ventricle. So here we're showing you the left lateral ventricle and the right lateral ventricle. And I do my best not to violate the ependema because if CSF is percolating in, you can get CSF hygromas or problems. 
And you also don't want blood products to leak into the ventricular system. So I start by cutting the mid body, um, and then I orient my scope anteriorly. And here I'm focusing on the, this is the dorsum of the genu right here, kind of where that arrow is pointing. And again, I just sort of dissect over to the arch of the A2, A3 junction, and then just divide those white uh, matter tracks with the bipolar. And here we're coming down to the rostrum, and this would be looking down towards the uh, proximal anterior cerebral arteries. Once that front part is disconnected, I then drop the head of the bed and I orient the scope posteriorly. And if the plan is to do a complete callosotomy, it's kind of a long reach, but you can usually get the entire callosum disconnected um, through a single anterior craniotomy. So here now the scope is uh, projected posteriorly. This is the sleeve of pyrachnoid above the vein of Galen back here. And we're reaching all the way back to pinch off those, those posterior fibers at the end. Uh, others advocate the lateral position for brain retraction. I like to just do straight supine nose up because it just keeps me oriented and keeps me right on midline. Um, when we started doing this procedure when I was in St. Louis as a junior faculty member, we did about 25 or 30 patients and we just looked retrospectively at our outcomes. And what we did notice is that in addition to the atonic seizures, other generalized seizure types had significantly reduced uh, post-operative seizure burden. And then we also analyzed in retrospect how the patients did if we did an upfront anterior callosotomy or an upfront complete callosotomy. What we saw is that uh, we had a greater proportion of patients, 90%, who did um, had favorable seizure outcome if we did a callosotomy upfront. And so that kind of influenced our um, decision-making with these procedures, and we tended to do more and more upfront complete callosotomies. And then this is a paper summarizing our first 50 or 60 patients we published a few years later, just confirming that what we saw was an, is a persistent improvement in seizure control with a more complete disconnection, which isn't too surprising if you hypothesize that bisecting the callosum will reduce synchrony. So um, in, in our hands, complication rate was around 10%, and these were these were complications requiring a trip back to the operating room. So this would be a bone flap infection, uh, hydrocephalus, uh, fluid collections, um, or, or hemorrhage in rare cases. But we didn't have any permanent neurological morbidity um, uh, in this subset. Um, so the, the conclusions we drew from our initial uh, um, experience with the open approach was that the callosotomy was effective for, for severe a refractory epilepsy, particularly those with generalized seizure types, such as atonic seizures, um, and that um, there was a subset of patients who failed an anterior two-thirds that we went back and completed the posterior. About half of those patients were flipped into a favorable outcome. So we'll often convert an anterior two-thirds to a complete open callosotomy in patients who fail the smaller operation. And our complication rate, despite our best efforts, was around 10% for um, these uh, problems listed here. As for the anterior versus complete debate, I kind of glossed over disconnection syndrome, which is a common question. But I have to remind you that the majority of these patients were very low functioning patients. Most of them had lennox gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, and weren't high enough functioning even to cooperate with neurocognitive testing. So the disconnection syndromes weren't something that was clinically a, a problem. So um, that's why we tend to do an upfront complete callosotomy um, in these lower functioning children because of the superior seizure control. Um, so, you know, as, as in most surgical disciplines, we're always working to minimize the invasiveness of our procedures and to decrease morbidity. Um, and open craniotomy, it's, it's not trivial. You know, even with a, you know, simple bifrontal craniotomy, you are near the superior sagittal sinus, bridging veins, uh, retraction associated complications, venous ischemia, infection. Those are all risks if you open the head, um, despite um, how skilled you are experienced. And also, you know, the, doing a craniotomy, that's perceived realistically as, as uh, something kind of scary for patients and families to consider. Um, when they've just been on anticonvulsant medication for years or even decades. And a lot of um, neurologists are reluctant to refer because they still see epilepsy surgery as potentially kind of uh, radical or invasive or barbaric. So if we had less invasive alternatives, we might be able to offer this procedure to more patients. There's definitely more patients out there 
who could benefit from epilepsy surgery than are offered um, epilepsy surgery procedures. And of course, we want to reduce pain and morbidity and shorten the hospitalization and recovery times, and ideally reduce overall health care costs. So as a fellow, we kind of dabbled with some of these ideas. We looked at the feasibility of using um, traditional endoscopes to perform endoscopic assisted callosotomy. We did uh, work in cadaver heads. We actually did a live swine model. This is a poor low, low resolution endoscopic screenshot, but we were using a uh, low resolution scope and a live uh, pig model to try and divide the corpus callosum. I can tell you this is very technically challenging and I kind of lost interest in it because to me it was too technically challenging. Um, there is a, a master of uh, endoscopy, Al Cohen, who's up at uh, Baltimore Johns Hopkins, and he and his colleagues when he was back in Rainbow Babies Hospital in Cleveland in, in Ohio um, were looking at the feasibility using cadaveric studies to do endoscopic uh, colossal disconnections using these types of approaches here. But Sandeep Sood has actually taken this and run with it, and um, he's he's published on this and talked about this. and. He does a very small keyhole craniotomy here with a small dural opening to about a two centimeter incision. And this is a uh, endoscope that he put together himself, which is uh, what basically connected to a, a sucker. Um, so you have lights, you have visualization, you have the sucker and, and he connects it to a nerve neuro navigation platform. And so basically with, uh, he can do bimanual um, endoscopy visualization and division of the corpus callosum. And he has excellent outcomes with this technique. Um, I, I kind of fell out of favor with the endoscopic approach because of my experience with the cadaver heads and with the, the swine model. And um, I was doing radio surgery for AVMs and I dabbled just a little bit in, in a non-invasive alternative to callosotomy using gamma knife in this, in this patient and a couple others. Um, th this was reserved for patients where uh, another craniotomy was contraindicated. This child had developed a bleeding disorder and platelet dysfunction. And so we weren't as able to safely offer a completion posterior callosotomy. So after a lot of discussion and discussion also with our uh, ethics and IRB board, we offered a radiosurgical disconnection performed with a, a gamma knife uh, uh, C model. Um, and this was performed um, with about four hours of treatment time and heavily plugged collimators to minimize the radiation to adjacent structures. And here's, you can see immediately after the procedure, the callosum, three months out, it's starting to swell and enhance. Six months out, it's significantly more uh, swollen. And then at a year out, it's starting to involute. And the clinical time course was interesting. After this uh, radiosurgical callosotomy, the first month or two, his seizures actually got worse. Um, and, but then thereafter, they almost completely, uh, his drop attacks almost completely abated. And prior to the disconnection, he was landing himself in the hospital with status epilepticus um, every two or three months. And since this completion of the callosotomy, he, he hasn't returned to the hospital. Um, I followed him for about 10 years before I lost track of how he was doing. And as far as I know, I don't have, he hasn't developed any secondarily induced malignancies, but I, I'm not advocating or recommending radio surgery for for epilepsy, although as you know, there is the Rose trial, Rose trial for medial temporal lobe radio um, surgery um, that Nick Barbara was running. But I think that's kind of dropped out of favor because of the advent of laser ablation. Um, so again, this talk is focusing on pediatric series because I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon interested in epilepsy surgery. And for me in our literature, this was the first large series of laser ablation in children um, for epilepsy. And this was from the group in Miami, Florida. My late friend Sanjeev Batio was a co-author on this paper. And in this paper, they presented uh, data on about 15 patients who underwent laser ablation, usually for focal seizure onsets. They didn't do any callosotomies in this paper, but this was sort of a proof of principle. They demonstrated efficacy in a number of patients with good seizure control using this minimally invasive technique. Um, this was the first case report that I believe was published utilizing laser ablation for corpus callosotomy. And the group in Stanford um, did a completion posterior callosotomy with a single fiber using visual ace uh, in a patient in around 2015. Um, okay, so laser ablation, what is this? So 
Um, in the United States, our FDA um, has approved this system to necrotize or coagulate soft tissue in the body um, as well as in the brain. The way that it works is that the MRI compatible laser fiber is introduced into the target and then the laser is activated and the energy of the laser is translated from light into heat at the target. And you can place the fibers with any number of stereotactic systems or platforms to target the area of interest. And then the key to this is that the MRI scan is done in real time using an, a thermometry phase sequence and it calculates a delta T or a change in temperature from baseline and uses some math to generate a thermal damage estimate of the region of ablation. Um, this has been used for about 10 years now for uh, tumors and increasingly in epilepsy. And um, while it was used mainly for, for treating lesions, it also can be adapted for disconnection, for example, in callosotomy. So there's two systems that are commercially available. Um, Visual ACE is a system on the left here depicted um, in this graphic and Neuroblade is depicted on the right in this graphic. Um, Visual Ace uh, is owned by Medtronic and Neuroblade uh, is a Monteris product. It's their only product and they just do brain while Visual Ace can be used for um, solid organs outside the brain. Uh, here's a diagram of the Visual Ace hardware. So there's an outer cannula, which is semi-flexible and it has a, a port for fluid to go in and to circulate through the cannula, cooling the laser fiber itself, and then it exits through the cannula as well. And this is pushed through with a simple peristaltic pump at room temperature, it's sterile lactated ringer. So from a safety standpoint, if there were a crack or a violation in the um, cannula, it, it's, un, it's less likely to cause an injury to the brain because it's low pressure uh, fluid being circulated. Uh, the fiber is about one and a half millimeters in diameter, and um, it can achieve about a two centimeter ablation diameter around the tip of the catheter. They have two types of catheters. There's a three millimeter and a 10 millimeter, and they have just the, the same dimension in the diameter, but there's a longer stretch that provides heating. Um, the uh, Visual Ace system is deployed through these MRI compatible bolts. These are either plastic or titanium. Uh, so a twist drill is performed along the uh, trajectory of interest and then the bolts is threaded down into the bone and it's hollow. And through the hollow bolts, you pass the visual ace fiber and, and, and secure it in place with this little collar here. Um, the system is deployed with a cart based mobile um, system which is handy because you don't require a full installation in your MRI scanner. And they have software that can shake hands with most of the commercially available MRI systems, GE, Siemens, Philips, et cetera. The Neuroblate system is, is similar but different. So the fiber itself is, got, is made out of uh, glass and it's less uh, flexible and it's a little bit wider diameter. So their standard catheter is a 3.2 millimeter diameter. And they have two different tips. There's the diffusion tip that just does a spherical zone of ablation. And then there's the side fire tip where you can push the energy um, in one direction. And then you can rotate that fiber to push that energy around kind of like a clock face. They also have a smaller diameter fiber that's about 2.2 2 millimeters diameter that's good for pediatric applications or for small lesions like a hypothalamic hamartoma. It's also deployed through a hollow bolt system, but it has this little positioner that sits on the bolt and it's connected to this little mini robot driver and you can advance and retract the fiber remotely when you're in the MRI control room. And you can also have it rotate the fiber if you're utilizing the side fire method um, to sculpt the laser ablation a little bit. Uh, this is just to summarize some pro some differences between the two systems, not really pros and cons, but the Visual Ace system is a little thinner, the, the fibers are versus the Neuroblate. Um, it's cart based and more mobile versus the more permanent installation for the Neuroblate. In terms of tips, uh, Visual Ace just has a three millimeter or 10 millimeter um, ablation length, and the Neuroblade has a couple different diameters and the side fire plus the diffusion tip. 
Um, in my experience, I've used both systems. The Visual Ace heats the tissue more quickly and you get to your final target volume more quickly, but it doesn't expand as far as the Neuroblade. The Neuroblade takes a little bit longer to get to your target ablation volume, but it seems to make a little bit larger lesions. Um, the planning software for Visual Ace typically is two or three slices along your catheter, while the Neuroblade does allow for more 3D planning to draw volumes, to draw regions of interest that you want to ablate or want to avoid ablating. Um, they both provide safety markers so that you can um, mark areas of interest and it will warn you if you're achieving temperatures that are risking thermal injury. And the Visual Ace actually even kick off if your safety marker goes above a, a warning temperature. Um, as for the bolts, um, the Visual Ace bolt has those two that I described. They also have a hybrid bolt that can you can swap an SCG electrode for a laser fiber probe. On the Neuroblade side, they have the titanium bolt. They're working on a ceramic bolt, which is better for MRI artifact. And they also have a hybrid SCG bolt that's in development. Um, this is what the thermometry looks like on a Visual Ace case. So you can see the, the laser heat depositing here during a run of ablation. And then this is the thermal damage map that's being created. Um, and this is a mathematical construct using this math, which I don't pretend to under, understand. So don't, don't ask me how that math works. But um, what I do know is that if you heat any part of the brain above 60 degrees, you have instant thermocoagulation. If you're below 43 degrees, you're going to have reversible thermal injury. And in between 43 and 60, dependent on time, you're going to have the development of irreversible thermal injury with protein denaturation and cell wall breakdown. And so this is a function of time between 43 and 60 degrees and distance from the tip of the probe. So for a short run of ablation, you'll get a smaller volume than a long run of ablation, you get a, a higher volume. And you reach a steady state because there's the uh, blood flow of the surrounding brain will start to pull the heat away. So you'll hit a point where you can keep ablating as long as you want and you won't get any larger of an ablation zone. Here's a screenshot from a Visual Ace case. You can pull this little slider across to see your thermal damage and then see your thermal damage estimate. So you can be working back and forth, moving the catheter, doing your ablation along the catheter. One of the nice things about the laser ablation is your post MRI uh, uh, imaging, your zone demarcating uh, thermocoagulation and necrosis um, is fairly well defined. It correlates nicely with a ring of enhancement with gadolinium. And on histopathology, you see a pretty sharp border for the thermocoagulation. And it also tends to respect um, peel boundaries and CSF spaces, which brings us back to its use in epilepsy. So. It's mostly been deployed in mesial temporal lobe epilepsy surgery, and the amygdala hippocampal um, structures are really well suited to this because they're surrounded by CSF. You have your temporal horn and your ambient cistern, um, and so it will tend to conform to the tubular structure. So typically, these are performed with an occipital approach. But the corpus callosum also is bounded by C uh, CSF envelopes, and as for the dorsal, and ventral surfaces, your heating is going to be limited by those CSF spaces, which will sink away the extra um, heat energy, although it can dissipate out laterally through the fibers of the closum and the forceps major. So we, um, in around 2016, we started doing these laser ablations in children, and we published our first dozen or so patients' uh, outcomes after we had 12 months of follow-up. And um, we were utilizing the surgical ROSA robot to deploy our our probes because we were using this for the SEG cases, and it naturally aligned itself with the use for the laser um, fiber deployments. Um, the first case we treated was similar to the Stanford case. It was about the same time as when that case report came out. This is a single Monteris fiber coming from a parietal approach to finish off this residual splenium after a previously unsuccessful anterior 80% uh, disconnection. Um, you can see that the Monteris fiber is a little bit thicker than a Visual Ace fiber, for example. Um, the second case we treated, we used the Visual Ace system because it was installed in our children's hospital. This was in our adult hospital. And for this one, you can see the trajectory taken was more of a frontal approach because there's some residual body with the splenium. So you have to be a little bit thoughtful when you plan these about what's the best trajectory to get to the area of interest 
and to ablate along um, the axis of the fiber. Uh, we also used the laser for a couple other partial colossal disconnections. We were still focusing on just single fiber ablations. I wanted to gain some experience with the technique and uh, the technology before doing bigger ablations. So here was a here's a patient who underwent a functional hemispherotomy on the right side, and we had a little residual genu and inferior frontal lobe. And she was still having some seizures, and we thought, well, we could go in open and take this out or do a single fiber ablation, which we did. As it turns out, it didn't impact her seizure outcome, so she was uh, did not was not helped by the laser ablation. But it was uh, an easy ablation to perform. She went home the next day, no morbidity. And the top right panel here is a young girl who had uh, Acardi syndrome, and typically they have complete agenesis of the corpus callosum. But in her case, she had this residual callosum, and so we did a single fiber complete callosotomy, right? So we took out her complete residual callosum. And she had a dramatic improvement. She had, she was an Engel class one. Her seizures just completely stopped after this, which was really gratifying. And this was another single fiber ablation of a young lady who had these photic induced seizures and her neurologist, uh, because of her preponderance of uh, her EEG posteriorly asked for a splenial disconnection. And I know the group in Brazil has published a large series of predominantly posterior disconnections for callosotomy. Um, I haven't done any upfront posterior disconnections except for this one patient, and she uh, did not have a good outcome from this. No morbidity from the procedure, but she wasn't helped. So once I'd gained a little confidence with the single fiber ablations, we started doing anterior two-thirds ablations with a catheter coming typically uh, obliquely in the frontal area near the hairline down to get the genu and the rostrum. And I started doing posterior uh, approaches to the body because I was trying to avoid um, putting any catheters near the forehead. And you can see the problem with that. So I'm showing you this uh, suboptimal position of the laser catheter. Um, despite having excellent registration and a really good solid platform, some deflection occurred, perhaps with drilling, perhaps when the fiber hit the dura. And the catheter went too low and missed most of the callosum. So we had to go back and reposition the catheter. Um, so after that experience, I started doing uh, frontal approaches, and I found that you can often hide the frontal catheter in the eyebrow, or just the tiny stab incision in the forehead is so minimal once it heals that it's really not a problem cosmetically. And so these are the typical anterior two-thirds trajectories that you can use in most patients. Um, this is only showing a single parasagittal slice, but obviously we're not going straight through the midline. You have to avoid the frontal sinus, the superior sagittal sinus, um, and any other vascularity in the midline. So these are, tend to be oblique trajectories, um, parasagittal to midline to contralateral parasagittal, which I'll show you. Uh, here's a patient with a Lexel uh, head frame on. Um, dock to the surgical robot for placement of the two fibers. Here's a fiber kind of hidden in the eyebrow, one just behind the hairline. Uh, and then a couple, couple points on trajectory planning. So this patient on the left is an ideal patient for a laser callosotomy. They have a nice, short, thick, straight callosum. Here's a patient you can do a single fiber near complete disconnection or a two fiber complete disconnection fairly easily. And the patient on the right is a candidate for, for a laser callosotomy, but it's kind of a challenging case. It's going to take at least three fibers to get a meaningful disconnection. The callosum's thin, so you could have some targeting challenges. So the rule of thumb I've kind of um, fallen into is if um, the body of the callosum is thicker than, sorry, is thinner than four millimeters, I'll do it open. And if it's four millimeters or, or thicker, then I'll, I'll offer a laser ablation. And in my hands, I've not done any four fiber complete callosotomies. There are those that advocate doing multiple fibers, but I think you start to get diminishing returns once you get higher than three to four fibers, because each one does have a risk with placement, um, does have a risk with the trajectory, and it prolongs the procedure. And the ablations can, can take a while if you have multiple fibers. Also, caution anybody who wants to do this, that the fornices are, are um, sweeping up Right around the right around the isthmus of the the colossal body, and right near the midline. If you're fi if you're doing your your isthmus ablation near the midline, you risk thermal injury to the fornices. So just to be aware of that. And I often plan my trajectories so that the fiber is passing this area, 
parasagittally, and so I'll often do the ablation off midline um, in that region of the callosum. Here's a video just showing the visual ace, two runs of ablation on the anterior fiber and about five runs of ablation on the body fiber. This is sped up about a hundredfold. It doesn't go this quickly in real life. This process and this looping video here actually takes about probably 90 minutes once you're in the scanner and everything is set up and running. Um, with the patient still in the scanner, you can still see the fiber present. You give a gadolinium injection and a T1 uh, image, and you can see the zone of ablation um, conforms pretty nicely to the uh, callosum. And you can see here where I was talking about going from obliquely from one side to the other side. So the workflow, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but um, the workflow that we did most of our ca ca cases with was placing the patient in the Lexel frame, putting on the, the CT fiducial box, getting an O-arm or a CT scan, um, then docking to Rosa to do the registration, robotic guidance to place the fiber. Then you have to disconnect from the surgical platform, go to the MRI scanner to do your ablation. And then in the scanner, you can remove the bolt and tie down the skin stitch. So you can you don't need to go back to the operating room. So you can free up the operating room for another case after the first couple of hours and you've placed the, the bolts in, in, in the targets. Just take you quickly through some shots of a case of fibers uh, the frame is placed, the fiber zones are kind of marked out, the patient is um, registered, docked to the robot. In this case, we had an intraoperative CT scan to do the registration. Uh, so here you can see the uh, fiducial box, the pins. We added a couple of bone fiducials early on just for a, a safety check. Um, register the robot to the uh, uh, fiducials attached to the frame, and then mark your sites place your bolts. In this case, we could drape in the intraoperative CT scanner, repeat the imaging, drop some um, cannulas, uh, some stylets down the cannulas, and then we can image our intraoperative position of the fibers, fuse it back to the navigation platform, and just confirm that everything is where we think it is before we head to the MRI scanner. There's alternative ways to do this. There's a system called ClearPoint that's fully MRI compatible, allows you to place and move the catheter positions in the MRI scanner if you're off target. And there's some advantages that, to that system as well. So here's what the uh, patient looks like as they're disconnected from the surgical robot and then is where they're brought and transported to the MRI scanner to the ablation. So here's that child's ablation. Here's an axial view showing here's one catheter uh, in cross-section, here's the fiber uh, along the uh, slice of this MRI scan. Here it is in sagittal view. And then here's the thermal damage estimate at the completion of the body run. Also, you can do this with three fibers. Um, that last patient was a planned two-fiber anterior, two-thirds disconnection. Here's a three-fiber disconnection. So here's the fiber you can see going into the genu, fiber in the body, and then fiber in the splenium. Here's the ablation of the genu, ablation of the body, ablation of the splenium. And then this is what the ablation looks like uh, in the MRI scanner. And then just to run you through in three dimensions as you go top to bottom, you can see that it's not all disconnected in the midline, but it's disconnected either parasagittal on the right or parasagittal on the left. And by scrolling back and forth between the axial and sagittal images, you can assure yourself whether or not you've completed the disconnection. And you can go back and do more ablation as long as the region of interest is still within the reaches of your fiber. So um, these typically take about five to six hours to do. There's a couple hours to place the frame, a couple hours for um, registration and fiber placement, and then the, the ablation itself. Um, there's no pain, um, blood loss, there's none, and length of stay is a little shorter with open callosotomy. So in the last five minutes, I'll just summarize um, our experience in our first 100 plus patients getting callosotomy. Um, in this retrospective study, it's th this is unpublished data um, that's submitted to, to epilepsy. Um, this is the distribution of different callosotomy types and approaches in the whole cohort. So the, uh, of the anterior two thirds versus complete, it was about one third anterior two thirds, about two thirds got complete. Of those that had open, it was about 80% versus 20% lit for those that were doing anterior two-thirds. 
we're doing a complete callosotomy. It's about 90% open and about 10% lit. And that's because we started using lit for the complete callosotomies more recently in our experience. When we do a completion extension, so a two stage, where we do the second stage, um, we're using lit more often. And in fact, the, in fact, all of the completion second stages these days are pretty much done with lit. Here's a typical open pre, immediately post-op and delayed follow-up MRI scan. And here's what lit looks like, pre-op, immediate post-ablation, and then at a long-term follow-up. And you can see the selection here between a thin colosum and a thick colosum. And this is just a timeline showing the adoption of the different techniques over 20 years. So purple is anterior. So you can see we started doing more completes after that first paper showed some improved efficacy and it's sustained where we did more completes versus anteriors for the most part. And the blue line over here is the incorporation of laser ablation into our practice. So you can see it started to replace open callosotomy as we gained some experience with it. In the total cohort, there was more boys than girls. Average age was about 10. Follow-up was about seven years. As I mentioned, the majority were open, about 13% were lit. Complications. So we had about 6% surgical complications overall. So six patients had a surgical complication requiring to back to the operating room. They all occurred in the open uh, craniotomy patients. We didn't have any surgical complications in the laser ablation subset. Okay, comparing all patients anterior versus all patients complete. So this is combining open and lit anterior, open and lit complete, similar follow-up, similar age at surgery, similar blood loss, similar surgery duration, and a slightly longer stay for complete. So the point being that if you add a complete disconnection, it doesn't add a lot to the morbidity of the procedure. Comparing all patients open versus all patients lit. Okay, shorter follow-up because we've been doing those uh, for a shorter period of time. Uh, they tended to be older patients, not exactly sure why that is. And this here is surgery duration. It's one hour longer to do the laser ablation on average. But post-op stay, it's two days shorter. So um, the median discharge was about three days versus open surgery is about five days. Now there's some outliers in here. There's some kids who were in the hospital a month for whatever reason, because they're pretty, some of these are pretty sick kids, but overall the lit patients do stay a shorter period of time. In terms of seizure control, now this is kind of muddy because the patients were not case controlled, selected prospectively, randomized or assigned. So um, what we would tend to do is we tend to offer lit on the sicker patients with really bad epilepsy. So I think that comparing open to lit is not comparing apples to oranges um, in terms of a retrospective review. Having said that, complete callosotomy had about 55 to 60% had a, what we categorize as a good outcome versus anterior two thirds, 71% had a good outcome. And one explanation might be that these were just sicker patients with more seizures to start with. Comparing open to lit, the lit patients seem to do a little bit better, but again, these were not statistically significantly different. So I'm not sure how much water that holds. A um, couple Kaplan-Meier curves. So the top one is just showing angle class one and two combined. So this is patients who had complete relief of their targeted seizure type or near complete relief of the targeted seizure type. And statistically, no significant difference, but a trend for a little bit better with anterior and a little bit better with lit. But if you look at all angle classes considered a good outcome, and so this would, an angle class three for a callosotomy is a good outcome. Your goal is to palliate what we see is that 70 to 80% do well um, in both cohorts, whether it's anterior or complete, whether it's open or lit. So everything's kind of regressing to that mean there, that it's a good operation, however you want to do it. It's a little bit of a busy slide. It's about the last slide, I think. If you just look at daily seizures, anterior versus complete, pre-op, post-op. Right, so you see a reduction in daily seizures with anterior, um, a reduction in seizures with complete that's pretty similar. Drop seizures, similarly, anterior versus complete, big drop off in atonic seizures, drop off with tonic, tonic clonic seizures. Looking at uh, open versus lit versus anterior complete, similarly, pre op, post op, pre op, post op. Not a big difference between open and lit, but definitely a treatment effect before and after any of the treatments. This is just looking at the subset of patients who failed an open, uh, sorry, failed an initial disconnection or were offered a second disconnection. 
Blue was their status after completion of their first disconnection. Yellow is their ingle status after offering a second stage. And what you'll see is that about half the patients flip into a good outcome if you offer a second disconnection. So looking retrospectively at this data, what we're concluding is that anterior and complete actually have similar efficacy accounting for group differences in baseline seizure burden. I suspect that as the same, if you have the same patient and offer a complete version anterior, they're gonna have better seizure control with complete. So we tend to do a complete as long as they're cognitively uh, not too, too advanced. Um, open and lit, I think, have similar efficacy as long as you're able to achieve a good disconnection with the laser. Um, the completion callosotomy works about half the time in those patients who fail their initial partial disconnection. Open surgery is a shorter operation. It's fun to do. Um, laser ablation is a longer operation. It's kind of picky. Um, lower blood loss, it's better tolerated by the patient. They have no pain. They have slightly shorter hospital stay. Um, and there seems to be less complications with laser ablation. Uh, I'm going to stop there and open it up. Uh, let me acknowledge my um, team on this. So uh, Diane is a resident at Washington University who helped summarize this data. Jared was a fellow at the time who's now faculty member at Washington University, and Becca is our current fellow here at uh, John Hopkins All Children's Hospital who helped me with a lot of this data analysis. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith, for that uh, excellent exposition of callosotomy as well as the both techniques and the outcomes. Um, I'm first of all uh, going to ask uh, uh, Professor Machado uh, for his comments and questions to Dr. Smith. Professor Machado. Hi. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nari, for your kind invitation. And thank you, Dr. Smith, for your excellent talk. Um, this uh, shows us that uh, with time, you, or you have improved this technique that is so old. Um, as you mentioned, uh, callosotomy uh, is a technique, a very old technique. Uh, I just have uh, one uh, comment or one question for you. And um, when you consider the results of uh, open surgery, you mentioned that uh, correctly, that uh, uh, complete section of the corpus callosum is the, uh, the, best, the, the best results for uh, concerning drop attacks or seizures. Uh, but with the uh, laser ablation, you show that you, you can have uh, similar results. Do you consider uh, the... the a disconnection with laser, a complete disconnection or a partial disconnection. For instance, when you have an irregular uh, corpus callosum or you utilize uh, two or three uh, uh, fibers, how, how do you uh, approach this? Because uh, the, the results are very good. So the, the question is, for an irregular corpus callosum, yeah. how do you ad address that versus completeness of disconnection with That's it. it? Yeah, I think there's a couple there's a couple responses to that. One is since we now have this minimally invasive technique, you can think about staging the disconnection more than you might with an open surgery. You could you could do a couple of fibers, do a majority of the callosum and see how the patient does and then bring them back to complete it with another one or two fibers on another day. And um, I usually try to ablate everything I plan on ablating, but it's true that sometimes the fiber doesn't end up where you point it. And when you start the ablation, you don't get all of the colossal fibers that you intended to. And so I think it is nice that with this minimal ISO technique, you can fall back to coming back on another day and finishing the job, so to speak, if they don't have a good response. However, most of these patients do have a good response. And then you wonder, could they do even better if we disconnect more? That's an open question. I don't know how to answer that one. As for the irregular shape of the callosum, it's if it's thin, I get worried. If it's thick, it's easy. You can target a thick callosum, it's a big target. But for example, the Monteris fiber, it's three millimeters, 3.3 millimeters diameter. If your callosum is three millimeters diameter and you're hitting at it edgewise, 
you can deflect or miss it. And so those, I, I don't even try to do those thin ones in that, in that regard. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Machado. Um, uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan, could I please invite you to uh, share your thoughts and uh, yeah. questions, thanks. Well, thanks for a great talk, uh, Dr. Smith. That was really informative. Um, one question I had for you was in our tumor, uh, in, in our epilepsy meetings, we often have uh, long discussions over the equi equipoise between VNS and corpus callosotomy for this group of patients. Uh, and I wondered how you decide which patients are going to get a callosotomy and which patients will get a VNS. And then following on from that, I suppose, how do you decide which patients will get a complete callosotomy on those who will get an anterior two thirds? Those are good questions. They come up all the time. Every time we discuss a callosotomy patient, we discuss those things. So in many cases, they come, they've already had the VNS, right? So that's an easy decision. Um, and then if they have a VNS, it can complicate the laser ablation because you are limited in, in the uh, imaging you can obtain if they have a VNS, but you can use a, a, a transmit receive coil. You can slow down uh, or cool, do cool off periods. So there's still ways to do lit with a VNS in place. But if they have a VNS, that's one strike against them for lit because I might technically rather just do it open than deal with the VNS aspect. If they come with no VNS and they're offering either procedure, um, VNS is FDA approved for refractory seizures um, in kids ages five and older. Um, if they have multiple seizure types and drops are not prominent, we're gonna do VNS first. If they have predominantly drops, we're gonna recommend callosotomy first. And in, in my experience, VNS is not very effective for callosotomy. Um, so that's the way we tend to do that. Many families are going to want what they want, though. Um, but if, if they're having injuries and drops, then we really don't even offer VNS unless they get a callosotomy and fail it. I think your second question was about extent of callosotomy. Yeah. Um, and that one I alluded to a little bit in the first half of the talk, which uh, about the, the cognitive status of the patients. So basically, if, if the patient's ambulatory and verbal, I probably won't do a complete callosotomy. We'll right. do an anterior two thirds, see how they do. And then we can stage the posterior part with a single fiber if they, if they wanna pursue it. Um, but if they're non-ambulatory, non-verbal or significantly delayed, I'll just do an upfront complete, um, if possible open or a maximal disconnection with three fibers. But I, I won't add a fourth fiber to do a complete just to make the image look like I did it complete. Great, thanks very much. And I suppose to add to that, um, I noticed that most of the fibers you're right are coming in from the right. I presume, is there a, is there a difference? Uh, do you take one, a left or a right approach because of non-dominance or uh, have you noticed a difference in complications from approaching from the left or the right with your laser? Yeah, that's a good observation, it's a good question. Um, so when I'm planning, yeah, I always just default start on the right side, but as you start doing the planning and you avoid the frontal sinus and whatever cortical veins are in your way and the shape of the anterior cerebral arteries as they wrap around the genu, sometimes it's easier to go on the left and it's just a better target and I'll immediately flip to the left side. So all things being equal, I'll do the burr hole, the twist drill on the right side, just in case I get a, a complication. Um, and that goes for the genu fiber um, as well as for the body fiber. Um, as for complications, I did have one patient with the laser treatment who immediately post ablation, um, we did his imaging, it looked perfect. And then we took out his fiber and the next day he developed a supplementary motor area syndrome. And we re-imaged him the next day and he developed a clot along the track of the laser fiber, I presume related to withdrawing it because there was nothing on the scan when we did the ablation. And fortunately, it was in that non-dominant frontal area, and so it resolved completely. So we didn't realize it as a surgical complication, but that's the one laser ablation-associated intracranial complication I've had. Um, and so I'm glad it happened on the non-dominant side. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellen Bogan. Um, before I go to Dr. Jalo, we have got to Dr. Jalo in the audience as well. Just uh, two uh, one question and also one housekeeping. 
uh, the uh, the question is that in terms of um, obviously you verify the position of the uh, your fibers with the MRI but is there any thermal injury or thermal um, uh, induced vasospasm of the um, anterior um, uh, cerebral arteries or uh, the, the, the uh, or running over the corpus callosum so when I'm planning the trajectories, I make sure I've got at least like three millimeters away from any significant blood vessel. And if you think about the way that the ACA sweep around in the shape of them, you can, you can sneak around and underneath them. Sometimes they're a little ectatic and then I'll flip to the other side. I will not turn the laser fiber on if it's touching a vessel because you can get a pseudoaneurysm, you can get a, a rupture. I know of cases where there have been vascular injuries from laser ablation associated with physical trauma from the laser probe or from, I think, thermal injury to the blood vessel. However, if you're very close to the vessel but not touching it, you can just burn away because the blood vessel blood flow will continuously wick away the heat. And in fact, you'll have trouble heating close to the blood vessel. It actually pro provides a heat sink effect. So as long as you're not touching it, you're safe to do it. And when you're doing the MRI scans in real time, you know where you are before you turn on the laser. Now, when you place the fiber, you don't know for sure until you get some imaging to document that. But yeah, if you're touching the vessel, I would not laser that portion. I might withdraw the catheter and, and ablate near the vessel, but not adjacent to it. Um, I only said that I'll ask you one question, but I have two other questions. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, when you have aneurysm coiling, um, the expense of platinum coils becomes more expensive than a clipper. And in terms of the expense of the operation, uh, which is more expensive? So one of my project ideas is a comparison of open to laser ablation to look at costs. Um, I think that laser is going to be more expensive. Um, you have MRI scanner time, MRI tech time. When you're doing the MRI scans, the MRI can't be used for diagnostic scans, so you're losing the revenue for the hospital for that reason. That's just the MRI part. Um, OR time is about the same. It's actually shorter. You're in the OR a shorter period of time for fiber placement. The, the fibers themselves are expensive. So, and then if you did three or four fibers, you can, to some extent, reuse them, but you have concerns about sterility. So I don't tend to reuse fibers for the visual ace. I put them all in, then you go down. With Monteris, I do move the fibers from bolt to bolt, though. So I can reuse one fiber on two or three trajectories. Um, my guess is it's probably about 25% more to do it with um, lit but they leave the hospital sooner. And so you'll save a little bit of money on ICU and, and bed stays. Thanks. And the, my last question um, uh, is that- uh, let, let, me, let me add on that though. But if you eliminate the six to 10% reoperation rate for surgical complications, it might all even out, but I haven't analyzed that. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. And in terms of most people who will go to do lit obviously would do a, a SEGs as well. Is there a big learning curve uh, in uh, doing lit? If you have the instruments, uh, how, how, how's the learning curve in getting? In getting I, I think it's a pretty it? steep learning curve. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of pickiness to the systems, putting the fibers where you want them, aligning, depending on what platform you're using. Um, planning your trajectories, um, selecting patients. I mean, I learned a lot. I made, some, I showed you some mistakes on the slides. Um, so, and I am aware of patients who have been hurt with laser ablation, you know, bilateral mammillary tract injuries for hypothalamic hamartomas. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not minimally invasive in, in that respect. You're, you're killing brain tissue, but you're at least able to do it without a craniotomy. Um, so I would advocate for anybody learning to do this to get somebody who's been doing it and doing with you for about five or 10 cases. So my first few cases I did with a colleague, Eric Luthart, who's a leader in laser ablation on the adult system. And I had I did about five cases with him and I started doing them independently. Thanks. Thank you. Um, 
And just a housekeeping uh, uh, announcement before I um, go to the next point. Um, at the end of the q and I will post the link or, uh, if you would like to get a certificate for, for the attendance, please give me a month for me to uh, email you the certificates. Um, if anyone has any questions, either put the hands up or put it, put your questions on the chat box. Um, can I ask Dr. Jalo, do you have uh, uh, for his observations and uh, questions? And uh, thank you. Naren, thank you so much. And Matt, um, excellent presentation. You know, I learn. I learn a little more each time uh, 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 when you speak about the lit, given your expertise. Um, yeah, the question I had, you say, uh, you said you don't recommend the laser if the, cor if the uh, corpus callosum is less than four millimeters. Are there any other factors that would make you favor an open operation uh, rather than the, the, the minimally invasive uh, laser ablation? Yes, the curvature. So if the callosum is really arched and really curving, it's just it takes so many fibers to tick, tick, tick along it. So um, and it, it's not I don't have like a measurement of curvature, but basically if, if I can't plan it with three fibers, I probably will do recommend just open or a, a, a subtotal disconnection. OK, that's uh, again, I think goes back to um, uh, the comment that you made. It's it's. If someone, if a center or an individual wants to start doing lit, there is a steep learning curve uh, that is associated with that, with the tech, with the techniques. But the nice thing too is that learning curve flattens out, and once you've got things working, the technology and the support, it can be really slick. These can go very smoothly and very quickly, and it's really gratifying. And also the patients, they just wake up and they're fine versus after an open callosotomy, you know, they're pretty stunned and don't do much. So that's kind of gratifying. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, the other question is, have you ever done open? To a, a, do you start off with the lit and then you complete it with an open callosotomy? Um, I've, I've not done that with any callosotomy patients. Certainly I've done the other way. Um, I have yeah. done that with failed lit patients for other things like a focal cord dysplasia, a tuber, or mesial temporal sclerosis. And for cortical lesions, open surgery after lit is easy. It's, not, it's, it's trivial to, to find the site and just go around it. But for mesial ablations, it's really difficult because your mesial temporal anatomy is totally distorted after a laser ablation. Um, you lose the temporal horn anatomy, the choroidal fissure. So those to me are daunting to do an open mesial temporal resection after a failed lit. And that's a, to me, that's a strike against lit for mesial temporal in kids. Okay. No, great learning. I think, again, great teaching points uh, uh, for the participants to, to learn. Thank you, Thanks, Dr. Diallo. Uh, Dr. Professor uh, Maurizio Iconangeli from Ancona, Italy, is here. Uh, Professor Iconangeli, do you have any questions? Hi, hi, Naren. Hello. Hello. Maurizio. Hi. Good talk, good teaching. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, in, in Italy, you have they started doing lit surgery um, for epilepsy uh, um, um, that you have heard of? Yes, but uh, um, uh, we, we, we don't deal with the um, pediatric patient. So in the older patient, uh, it's still um, something not so frequent, at least in, in our department. But uh, it's, a, it's a good, uh, and we use something similar even for the interventricular tumor as approach. Thank you. Yeah, lid is actually great for intraventricular tumors because of the conformality of the CSF spaces. So we've actually I've done a number of SEGAs, subependymal giant celestiocytomas for tuberous sclerosis, and they're actually kind of ideal for laser ablation because if you get the fiber in that tumor, you heat it, it gets to the CSF space, and there it's conformal by nature. Yes, we can mutuate uh, all the teaching from uh, um, other diseases, applying that uh, in. Uh 
in even if it, the that specific technique uh, uh, did uh, was uh, not not born for a, a specific task but uh, in some way uh, as you as you said uh, if we, we learn the the peculiarity of the technique we can apply it, it uh, even uh, not in epilepsy or in, in this specific case but but the the meaning the the peculiarity the useful of that technique can be used uh, in other uh, disease this is a general concept of course sure thank you uh, dr um, smith i have got uh, two questions you know you earlier talked about endoscopy and is there any way that you can uh, incorporate endoscopy with a laser rather than doing it uh, in the, in the I mean, because the laser requires a completely rigidly fixed head in the MRI scanner, um, it's hard to visualize utilizing the endoscope at the time of the ablation. You could use the endoscope to help guide a fiber placement if you could secure it somehow. There's no magic to the bolts that are used. It's just a way to hold the fiber in its position, but. I, I doubt you could adopt any sort of intracranial instrumentation with the lit because it has to be done in the MRI scanner with MRI compatible tools and equipment. And also the head just can't move or you're out of that phase MRI and you're you're not seeing what you think you're seeing. But would you be able to do uh, in with the open operation using endoscope and laser? Um, is that feasible or is that? Well, um, with you can do an you can do an endoscope assisted open callosotomy similar to what Sandy Sood published, mm -hmm. and then you can use laser for callosotomy open using the Omni. It's, I think it's called the Omni Guide. It's a little CO two laser. I think Mike Edwards wrote up a case series of those in Stanford, um, and I've tried those. The problem for me with that laser is it's invisible, mm -hmm. and so. If you activate it and you're not totally, you, you can punch through a vessel or or hit something you don't want. So because there's no there's no feedback, it's just an invisible laser with a lot of energy. So I've only tried that on a couple callosotomies. That's not the laser ablation thermal interstitial thermal therapy laser. I'm talking about I'm talking about a handheld laser for for um, surgical. Like I've used those to cut a fatty phylum, things like that. But my very last question. Um... It's a good thing I don't drink alcohol, otherwise I'll be drinking all those last last classes. Uh, in terms of, um, do you, where do you think lit is going to go in the next five years in terms of corpus callosotum? Uh, in term, where do you see the advances in the technology come for 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 this technique uh, uh, to improve its efficacy? That's a good question. I think um, more and more centers are doing it. I think people are becoming more confident about it. There's more publications about it. I have some more slides showing other publications and so on. So um, I think it's it's not going to replace open, um, but I think it's going to become a standard alternative to open. And I think that centers that don't offer it, at least in the United States, um, may be at a little bit of a disadvantage. In terms of the technology and advancing things, I think we're kind of hitting a floor, um, or sorry, a ceiling. What I didn't talk about is the side fire utilization. So you can take the Monteris, use the side fire, and then if you've got the curving callosum, you could you could aim it down and you can get a little bit more fiber disconnection with the same um, single fiber. However, in my experience, the side fire to me, it sounds good, but in practice, it still gives you just a sphere. It's just a little bit ovoid rather than spherical. It's not a game changer in terms of the directionality of the heating. Um, unless you had a curved fiber that you can deploy in a curved fashion, something really technologically interesting, you're going to be stuck with straight ablations and limitations in getting them there. Um, yeah, I don't think we're going to see a radical change in the next five years. I think we're just going to see more use of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan, could I please uh, invite you to give a closing remarks? Uh, uh, thank you very much. No, I think it's a very interesting um, topic. And it, I think, as Dr. Smith said, I think uh, laser uh, will 
is slowly taking over in lots of ways over a open surgery um, for temporal abectomy, for insular treatment, for corpus callosotomy, as we've heard today. So I think the future does look in that direction, but we always seem to go through fashions and fads. Uh, and it's likely that we'll go full circle in 20 years again. But um, I, I think it's an interesting concept. And I think um, obviously it's, it's gaining some traction around the world and lots of places are now uh, getting laser technology and it'd be interesting to see how what the future holds. But uh, thank you very but Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Very interesting talk. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Machado. Pro Professor Machado, do you have any last, word, last words, please? Thanks. Oh, yes, uh, uh, it's a very interesting te technique. And uh, thank you both uh, Marion and Dr. Smith for the excellent talk. Uh, I hope with the more people using this uh, technique, the, the, the price of the, the whole system will come down. And this will allow more people around the world to get uh, to, into this uh, technology. But uh, I think it's uh, so important for pediatric neurosurgery. And I thank you very much for your uh, talk, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Thank Honored you. To be here. Thank you very much, Professor Marshall. So this, um, I have put the link for the certificate on the chat box, and this uh, gives me. Uh, uh, the pleasure of thanking um, Dr. Smith for taking time out. He had been operating uh, all night last night. It was meant to be his quieter of his days, but um, yeah, but thank you very much for this fascinating and insightful lecture on a on a rapidly um, uh, uh, probably increasing practice um, uh, for us who particularly haven't seen it to really get a feel of it. Thank you very much, um, sir. And I thank um, uh, Professor Machado and uh, uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan for uh, your insightful comments, uh, questions, uh, and um, making it a rich uh, um, session. And uh, to all those attended, uh, I appreciate this is Friday afternoon. Uh, and um, I think it shows uh, the commitment and thank you very much. And I look forward to having you all at the next masterclass. Wishing you a good week, great weekend. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.